good afternoon. My name's Hugh Fisk, and I've gotten a bit of an addiction. A, a crowdsourced archaeology and data addiction, that is, but an addiction all the same. A bit about me. Uh, my interest in archaeology was sparked in the summer of 2012 by taking part in Dig Ventures' first crowdfunded dig at Flag Fen, which you've already heard about. Uh, after three weeks there on site, I ended up supervising my own test pit, and I've been there with them. Every, no, I've been with them every year since then. Initially as a paid-up uh, crowdfunding venturer, and latterly as a member of the team actually on site. Uh, I'll be involved in their main summer dig again later this year, and I hope I'm allowed at this point to insert a quick plug and say that I owe them a lot, and I'd recommend them to anyone wanting to take part in a fun yet completely professional field school. For me, an unexpected connection between my time at Dig Ventures and Micropasts came last summer when I was their digital imaging manager, an unfortunate acronym, working with, the, working with Adam Stanford, who uh, any of the archaeologists among you may know as Aerial Cam, uh, at Leyston Abbey in Suffolk um, on the formal site photography and photogrammetry. Uh, through this, I first got involved with creating 3D models using the ubiquitous PhotoScan software. And what I learned there set me up to become involved in 3D object modelling for micropasts. I won't bore you for much longer by talking about myself, but I will just outline my other archaeological connections. Uh, I work part-time for Ian Rowlandson, who's an Iron Age and Roman pottery specialist based on the south coast near me, and uh, I'm his assistant. I'm also on the committee of my local, uh, local archaeological society uh, with responsibilities for maintaining their website and for on-site uh, photography, mostly of the high-angle pole-mounted variety. Until fairly recently, I was also a weekend volunteer guide at Fishbourne Roman Palace, which is close to where I live. My involvement with Micropasts started very early uh, in its history. I became aware of it shortly after it started up last year. Back then the software was a little buggy, sorry Dan, and sometimes frustrating to use and after a few weeks I went off to do some practical archaeology instead. I returned to Micropast in the autumn and got down to some serious transcribing and photo masking sessions. Sensing an opportunity to become more involved and fresh from my 3D masterclass earlier that summer, I put myself forward for the creation of 3D models, and to date I've created around 30 of them. In this image, you can see my model of the Bone, bone Dirk, which has probably aroused the most interest of all the models I've worked on due to the size of the original artefact and the beauty of the shape and the degree of workmanship it displays. The online version on Sketchfab has been, associate, has, has been annotated with clickable captions that transform the rotatable image from a curiosity into a proper educational tool, and the credit for that must go to Neil Wilkin. In addition to the mainstream activities of transcription and photo masking, I've also volunteered to take part in helping Jennifer with consolidation of the data generated by the trans transcription tasks. The strengths of micropasts, I'd like to say at this point that the strengths greatly outweigh the weaknesses, such as they are. Uh, the enthusiasm and encouragement have been an inspiration and no doubt are a major factor in the success of the campaign to date. Uh, great use has been made of social media to promote and maintain public interests in the Micropasts brand. They've also been very active on the Micropasts forum, helping to resolve user problems and cheering along those that have fallen behind, quite often me. Another thing I've appreciated particularly are the clear introductions and instructions, sorry, the clear instructions in how to complete tasks they're straightforward enough to grasp easily, but also sufficiently detailed on a second reading to offer solutions to most problems encountered. The first area for improvement I've identified is actually in the management of users, users themselves. Before I came in, became involved in the 3D modeling process, I would sometimes wonder how certain people on the leaderboard, and I'm only referring here to one or two, could put on hundreds of tasks a day when I struggle to do a few dozen. I came to the conclusion that the leaderboard format was encouraging competitive behaviour. After all, that is surely the point of a leaderboard, to display the highest scoring participants. Once I was able to see the output from the photo masking tasks as a 3D modeller, I could see that in order to get closer to the top, 
One or two participants would create dozens or even hundreds of masks that must have taken all of 10 seconds each to create, compared to the couple of minutes taken for each one by more careful people, and the five minutes or so for card transcription tasks. This hurried completion of photo ta masking tasks led to some very substandard masks, which created a lot of extra cleaning up work for the few of us actually making the models. Possible solution? Uh, one way to help stop this, in my opinion anyway, would be to make the whole process less competitive. This could be achieved by rejigging the tasks completed list so that it is no longer a public facing leaderboard, but is alphabetic by username. Users could still see how many tasks they have completed, but much less easily see where they are compared to others. The leaderboard format could still be available behind the scenes for MicroPass staff to review and ascertain who their most committed participants are, should they need to do so. As a committee member for my local archaeology society, I took it upon myself to circulate an email to all members saying how much I was enjoying being involved with MicroPasts and suggesting that they take a look for themselves. I received no feedback at all from the email, which set me thinking about what the limiting factors could be that put people off participating in the various tasks. I came to the conclusion that there may be a couple of incorrect perceptions created when potential users are faced with the task screens on the MicroPasts website. One, that the tasks are too difficult and require more skill to complete than an average person would possess. And two, a major commitment in time and effort is needed. Possible way around that. Uh, in order to counter these perceptions, I think there needs to be an emphasis made when promoting MicroPasts via social media, media and in whatever advertising is used, that no prior experience is necessary. A task such as photo masking merely requires the user to draw around a shape on the screen using their mouse and a modicum of care. Such tasks individually take up little time and are suitable for, for people just filling in a few free minutes in their busy day. Unlike the transcription tasks, photo masking requires little in the way of ability to read English and is therefore suitable for non-native English speakers. In contrast to photo masking, the transcription tasks do often need an ability to, to decipher sometimes arcane English words and obscure abbreviations on handwritten cards of variable legibility written by specialists anything up to 100 years ago. Thus, transcription tasks should perhaps not be portrayed as suitable for everyone. The future. As someone who is looking, who is looking to learn how to use GIS mapping software to better analyse historical information, I'd like to see new specialist tasks using open source software such as QGIS. This could be used to display fine spots of particular categories of artifact, for example, or to look at tra trading patterns, or basically reinterpret any sets of data that would benefit from being displayed in a graphical way. I saw from a recent post on Twitter that the British Library, boo, has just announced the latest phase of a crowdsourced project to geo-reference their map collection. How about something similar for the BM? Archives in libraries and museums around the world contain a plethora of unique and valuable historical resources. I'm sure this is already under consideration, but how about working with other museums on digitizing their collections? Thinking more locally, the vast Imperial War Museum Library, which has recently been under threat of closure, as an example. Historically, such collections were difficult for the general public to access, if not entirely hidden and inaccessible, and under the current budgetary difficulties, may soon go back to this state of affairs. Digital technology has not only opened access to these collections, but enabled users to aggregate information from many different sources at the click of a mouse. Uh, to briefly quote from a research paper I found online, uh, Quote, we may be quite tempted to argue a utopian position that digitization of these collections provides the general public with the ability to discover a much richer, broader, and objective sense of their own histories, as well as information about the communities to which they belong. To finish up with, I'd like to offer a final thank you to everyone at MicroPasts for feeding my habit by setting up this fascinating project and helping people like me to assist in various small ways to, to make public what has hitherto been hidden away in stores and filing cabinets. Thank you very much.